Hello, uh, warm welcome to all our listeners. Uh, this podcast is presented to you by Third Lane. Uh, this is basically a part of a series of podcasts uh, of conversations that we are having with authors, artists, and researchers, uh, and who happen to be contributors at our magazine in the first issue at least. Uh, I'm Ashita. I'll be your host for the evening. And today we have with us uh, Meg Chakraborty and Rita Ritka Dotto, both of whom have uh, generously contributed to the first issue of our magazines. Mehak is a freelance multimedia journalist and writer. She's also my friend. I've known her since school. Uh, so she's, uh, she's an avid traveler, a reader, an artist, and a very creative person overall. Uh, and she has an uh, MA in political analysis. And her work has appeared on BBC, Roads and Kingdoms, The Daily Beast, and all such like, really nice places. So that's Mehek. And Rito Rekha, she has recently completed her MPhil from the Department of Women's Studies at Jadavpur University. I have known her since my master's, uh, which she did from Jadavpur. And she has done her bachelor's from uh, Calcutta, from Lady Brebon College, Calcutta University. Her MPhil thesis uh, was on uh, the Chechen Black Widows. Uh, so yeah, she has worked on really interesting themes and uh, her piece for Third Lane was also somewhat related to this, although not uh, completely related to her MPhil thesis. So I'm going to uh, let my speaker speak now, as speaker start now. And so Mehek, uh, could you go first? Tell us a bit about yourself. Hi. Um, hi. Uh, so as Mahashwata already mentioned, I am a multimedia journalist and a freelance writer and also been doing a bit of research. And I completed my MA last year, after which I've been trying to shift uh, the focus of my work towards more uh, social justice issues. And uh, the piece I've written for the magazine itself comes as a part of uh, the changing kind of shifts in my work. And I'm really excited to be talking more about it. Um, yeah, back to you, Mahashwata. Yeah, okay. So uh, I'm going to move on to Ritorika and ask her to say, uh, you know, something about herself. And this is going to be a terrible yeah. introduction because I don't do much of anything. <laughs> I just completed my MPhil and uh, I'm trying to get into PhD somewhere here. So I have shifted topics sort of because I was interested in the Chechen rebels as Mahashata said. And uh, this is kind of related because uh, I was working on Chechen rebels, uh, female rebels were the primary topic, but I was also reading a lot about people who were detained in these military camps. So the most uh, obvious uh, mirror to that is the Kashmiri situation over here. So when I started, uh, I am sure Mahek can, uh, you know, speak a lot more about it. So I'm, I'm not going into that. But once I started reading about India, I realized that um, illegal detention is not something that just happens in particular spaces uh, in India. It happens everywhere. It happens all the time. So and especially because UAPA has become such a, a debatable topic now. Everybody is talking about it for good reason. I think it's important to start reading these narratives because once I started reading some of the narratives, this is something that really scared me. So I started reading more about it. That's it. Um, could you elaborate? Uh, this is like a segueing into the interview, uh, the, the podcast basically. But could you tell us a bit more about UAPA, uh, what it is and explain it basically to those? I mean, yeah. everybody is aware of what it is, but maybe a bit more detailed. Yes, yeah, something that I, uh, something very interesting that I read about the UAP, I'm going to start up, start with that. So it's basically the Unlawful Activities Prevention Act, right? And the, there's an article by B. Anuradha who was herself arrested because of, uh, under UAPA. And her husband was also arrested under it. She is this woman's rights activist uh, from, the, from South India, but then she was arrested, I think, in UP or Bihar, somewhere around that area. So she has this really interesting article where she writes about how unlawful UAPA actually is. And it is, if you look at every single element, how the arrest takes place, how the police custody, all the things about police custody that takes place, all of it is unlawful because when the police have no way to arrest you using lawful means, they use UAPA. That's what it is. 
because for example uh, when she was arrested and this is for all the cases like you can uh, compare it to any of the cases that are available out there the police usually come in um, normal clothes they are not wearing their uniforms and they usually take you in not their squad cars their usual cars so it's a it's a kidnapping when uh, for example mahaban mohammad amir khan he was arrested in 1997 and he was he had to be in jail for 14 years he had done absolutely nothing so when he was first arrested he thought that it was a kidnapping he had no idea that it was the police uh, who were capturing him and every single element about the uapa uh, for example uh, the fact that you don't have to you don't have to produce the criminal in court uh, within a period of 48 hours they can be kept in police custody for however long the police want and the court also permits that uh, all of that kind of comes down to the fact that they have to force a confession out of the criminal uh, or not the criminal the court and good criminal so all of these things what this leads up to is the fact that it, it's a way to justify police unlawfulness so that is something that i found really interesting because if uh, the based on the narratives that i have read if they don't have any evidence to catch you that's how they catch you the opa mm. no i can see why uh, that might have uh, i shouldn't say inspired or rather you know terrified you and all of us who would uh, yeah you know and made you basically choose something uh, you know prisons basically to write on to this particular theme to uh, invest your energy on i mean it's it's quite relevant considering the fact everything that has been happening and we have been uh, like the past couple of years and rather uh, that's a that's a different story to tell um so i am going to move on to mehak for my next question basically um he ritorekha engages with the political issue in a in an analytic in like but like uh, at least in the article for third bench he uh, engages with it in a very direct and very analytical fashion uh, she chooses she she worked on memoirs prison memoirs and talked about uh, direct experiences but through an analytical lens of uh, of the literary uh, criticism and literary theory but mehak's piece on the other hand deals with a similar if not uh, a similar situation uh, you know the political complexities of kashmir the heavy militarization uh, uh, of of kashmir in a completely different manner she engages with it with the help of kashmiri folklore associating the ranthas and the jinns and uh, you know the figure supernatural figures with the political uh, situation in kashmir the state repression the militarization and violence uh, basically in kashmir as like a sense of evil so a completely different approach so what i am going to ask mayak is what made you think of this connection um so like i mean the first obvious thing here is that like i mean um, the space itself right because uh, any kind of um, daily engagement or let's say even literary engagement with kashmir i think Uh, at least for me that's my opinion of it of course people can have different opinions but uh, you'd have to be really ignorant to kind of you know i, I mean willfully ignorant to gloss over the political realities of this place and um, you know of course folklore is very rooted in um, you know like oral traditions and kind of narratives which people pass on from one generation to another so um here we're looking at a generation which has i mean our generation let's say you know our generation and beyond has which has only seen conflict growing up so you know of course it becomes a part of any kind of tales they tell you so i mean that's one of the kind of reasons let's say main reasons that uh, i tried to bring these themes together but also uh, you know um, like this is while writing the piece itself it uh, i mean i realized this was in my mind it's not something i very intentionally kind of drew parallels but you know like the i mean that entire um, feeling we get from the supernatural it's uh, let's say horror or being haunted by it right so um, that is something while writing the piece itself i realized uh, how um, for so many people you know after listening to a lot of uh, stories from people here as well as my own experience of let's say just walking around streets over here um, how how much uh, the presence you know just the visuals of uh, the uh, the military presence here kind of stays with you and um, which is why i use the word haunting as well because it does uh, you know it's it does linger in your mind uh, and um, 
of course like you know a lot of people come to kashmir um, as tourists who don't really go into these spaces where the military is very visible but um, even then even if you don't go into these spaces they are very visible and kind of stays with you throughout so yeah, i think that's one of the i mean that's another reason and yeah, like i mean uh, beyond that i would say that it's it would be a, some sort of injustice to not uh, acknowledge political realities um, despite talking about the cultural i mean even if you're focusing on let's say a cultural story because of course the culture itself here is very unique and i think uh, that should be you know kind of preserved through narratives as well as all kind of stories and you know different forms but uh, yeah at the same time like it is a bit of an injustice to not acknowledge how the current situation which has been uh, going on for decades now how it has um, impacted even the culture itself right so yeah that's pretty much it oh i was wondering about you know the 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 deep sense of evil that is there that is underpinning the picturesque i mean you you see like when you're wandering around in kashmir see in autumn mm-hmm. or in spring or something like that, you see the flowers you see the the the, the chimney yeah, yeah. you behind it behind you you have a sense that there is a back uh where yeah. the political machinations are on and people are suffering so uh that in fact in that in fact uh, sort of the poetics of the place that 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 becomes an integral part of the poetic okay you mentioned uh, the sitting downtown shinagar in your age mm-hmm. in your article which is like i have been to kashmir as well but i was like strongly discouraged from going there so yeah. you say something about going to places where you are support for not supposed to go as an indian national <laughs> tell us about that experience of yeah of course i mean so the thing is uh, on the one hand you know like um, i mean the irony of this is that on the one hand uh, kashmir of late especially has been kind of promoted as this uh, i'm mainly talking from a tourism perspective because i focus i mean most of my work has been like very travel uh, culture focus right so this is just from my perspective um but yeah like so off late like uh, kashmir has been really promoted as a safe uh, travel destination right and you'll see a lot of um, you know uh, influencers mainstream i don't know like uh, publications promoting travel here and calling it safe for tourists but uh, at the same time uh, there are very um, there are very strong uh, strongly delineated spaces you know like you can't uh, not you not just you can't like you wouldn't be taken into these kind of spaces right so for me um it wasn't like the sense of adventure that okay this is you know forbidden territory i want to go into this space but it just came out of this need of kind of um, seeing it for what it is right because also i am a journalist i am curious about you know like what is the reality about um, say somewhere like downtown which is which has been uh, constantly portrayed as this um, you know like i don't know space of anti national so to speak right and uh, of course that uh, is really you know like some parts of it or even let's say on on a certain day when protests are happening if that happens right but at the same time um, just uh, completely limiting um, the portrayal of a space to that it kind of feels uh, very yeah it it's kind of insidious because there is so much more to it right so for me um there was this experience of um of course visiting spaces which we i wasn't supposed to see right and um, it kind of shook me a lot because i think i kind of mentioned this earlier that yeah like you know you don't see a lot of the um like security apparatus and the kind of militarization um that exists in this place in the touristic spaces so to speak where uh, most indians end up and um, another thing is i have been uh, you know like kind of i mean it was my own inquiry but also i have been forced to confront uh, that reality of indian um, you know like of what india has been doing to kashmir as well because when you are in these spaces you clearly you know it's not that you're a target but like you clearly are not from there right so it kind of inspires a lot of curiosity from people over there who would want to talk to you and um, like once in a while let's say hostility as well but like mostly curiosity and Uh, these are the kind of places where you actually get to you know like listen to narratives of people um and the kind of uh, you know oppression that they have been going through as the poso like in a more uh, sanitized clean happy space where you don't really get to engage with the issue as much so and that's been my experience going into these kind of spaces 
So that makes it like that sort of brings us to the question of uh, the ethics of representation. Like when we go to such politically charged atmospheres where people are suffering on a daily basis, how do we represent that? How do we write about that? Mm -hmm. Do we get? To, do we have the right to aestheticize it? What is the ethics of of representing such spaces or writing about such spaces? Which would lead me back to Rito Rekha, where uh, I would basically accept his research in prison, another such space space of repression of uh, you know a manifestation of basically uh, uh, a repressive uh, state apparatus. So I would actually uh, like attempt to invert the question that I posed to Mehek, like there the picturesque was underpinned with the evil of the state and uh, with, 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 with suffering and things like that. Here, it, the, the, the suffering and the repression, they are overt. Like you can see people uh, people being unlawfully thrown into jail, they being, them being tortured, they being, uh, you know, victims of great injustice and cruelty. What, how would you attempt like in in the memoirs that you've read have you noticed like what is the poetics of the prison that have been uh, you know uh, illustrated or illuminated in this te text have has the, is there any scope at all for redemption that is what i want to ask you is it is it ethical to look for redemption within such spaces as a researcher or an observer i don't know the print term for that i think uh the thing that you said about is it ethical to look into these things of course it is because uh, for example when i was reading about uh, minakshi uh, mukherjee sorry <laughs> the, the other memoir that i was mentioning the thing that struck me the most is that this is a space of immense cruelty but this is also a space of immense kindness so I don't think we should overlook one for the other because these are prisoners who are looking, for example, one of the examples that I provided in the article that it's not easy to rear a child in this particular atmosphere, but prisoners do absolutely selfless acts for each other. So we should definitely look into these things because uh, they don't have that much scope for, uh, not scope for kindness. Like we can be kind if we want to, we can afford to be kind. They cannot afford to be kind for them if you have to, uh, bring up someone else's child that basically means you're putting in uh, five six hours of more labor to maybe uh, get a bowl of milk or something like that it's not easy and you have to face all of the extra repression that comes along with it so the fact that they do that for absolutely no reason other than the fact that they're kind that's it they're selfless they're kind they want to build up this sort of pseudo family within prisons i think that's absolutely brilliant and also, um, when I was reading about any of the memoirs, uh, one thing that struck me is the fact that these people are somehow kinder than us. Because, um, for example, when I was reading uh, Arun Ferreira's um, memoir, something that struck me is that this is not just a thing about women's prisons, though, how, however. Because suppose um, Maxillite prisoners, Maoist prisoners, etc., they were not allowed uh, food from their homes. They were not, uh, for example, a relative could not turn up to court and hand them food like you could do with the other prisoner. But uh, the other prisoners always uh, kept food for them, like they preserved that food for them, some, anything that came from their houses so that these Naxalite and Maoist prisoners could eat when they uh, were returning back from uh, the court to the prison. So these acts of little kindnesses, I think these are extremely important when we are reading about uh, prison because we have to know about the people there. We have to know that the immense cruelty that they face does not change them completely. They still possess that ability to be absolutely selfless. So yes, that is something that I think should be highlighted a lot. And also in, um, for example, Rimpel Mehta's uh, book, something that she mentioned is that when she went to prison, what she wanted to ask people about is the violence that they face. The obvious thing, the one that we all want to ask uh, prisoners. But one thing that the prisoners told her is that we don't want to talk about violence. We want to talk about love. They wanted to talk about their love lives. They wanted to talk about their husbands. They wanted to talk about their other, uh, their lovers in maybe the male words. They wanted to talk about their lovers in the female words. They wanted to talk about love. So that is something uh, we have to realize that we don't frame the prisoners' narratives. They frame their own narratives and we have to listen to them. So of course, kindness and love are things that should be highlighted, I think. Okay, so as we can see, even in you know the darkest corners, the darkest manifestations of state violence, there can be like if we dig deep enough, we can find traces of 
um, possibilities for redemption and we can redeem the ratings. She will actually uh, lead me to ask Mehek this, uh, my next question, which is uh, basically uh, about the deeply, you know, personal inflection that we see in her work. Like it is about a really politically charged issue, but it's very, pers it, it's uh, like uh, your piece is extremely personal and, and it's, uh, it's, it's extremely experiential. If you talk about all the stories that you've heard, you, the people that you've met while you've been traveling, uh, and as I've introduced you earlier, like you are a researcher. So my next question is basically about your, you know, methods of uh, your journalistic methods. Like how do you, is it always an interplay between the personal and the analytical for you when you write your pieces or which do you, uh, do you tend to lean on a particular uh, side in this sort of binary that uh, I, between personal and political. I mean, like, of course, I'm, I'm going to be really cheesy if I say the personal is political, right? But at the same time, um, I mean, jokes apart, but uh, the thing is that for me, I think it does, like, you know, both of them have an important part to play in each other, you know, like, influencing. Um, but yeah, like, I can't, uh, at least with, especially with my academic um, work, I have not been able to do analytical work without actually like going deep into an issue through a very personal lens to be honest i mean with uh, journalistic work at least you know it's because a lot of it uh, involves reporting and engaging with people anyway so there is that kind of uh, influence of what i've experienced right but at the same time with um, academia i think especially because i'm in the social sciences and you know, I, I think I am a little um, extreme on this kind of school of thought that without like having lived experience or, um, you know, kind of immersing yourself in a subject, it's uh, pretty difficult to, you know, um, analyze and kind of come up with, um, uh, you know, to kind of identify patterns, so to speak, uh, to break ground on that, um, uh, in that sense. But yeah, because, uh, you know, I think like for me, it's uh, the methods itself, I guess it's uh, it's a bit difficult to describe it, but like it's I really try to absorb um, whatever's happening around me. And um, I do, I, I, I mean, I cannot uh, pretend to be neutral about things, right? I do kind of go into a situation with preconceived notions or, you know, with my own beliefs. But I think um, it's really important to... Um, to just I at least you know like with uh, with the kind of uh, with the kind of work I did for my thesis as well like it was very important for me to uh, reach out to um, people on a more personal level rather than you know going at it as an academic as such you know like because uh, even with the research I was doing last year in Kashmir which for three months I was um, doing a bit of research on um, you know what security means to individuals and because you know it's such a deeply militarized space and there is there's so much security apparatus here it's you know this is such a buzzword here but like kind of my motivation was to understand what do people how do people perceive that physical security itself and of course from coming from a political science background from the theoretical idea of human security so yeah during that research i think um, i did uh, record a lot of my conversations right but like you know when i was looking back at them and making notes i realized uh, most of the time was kind of spent in those informal, let's call it informal, right? As an academic, those conversations. And that's as a tool for me, that's more important to kind of, you know, talk to someone on a human to human basis rather than looking at them as a um, subject or like to be studied or analyzed. Of course, we do go in with that as academics or journalists as well. We do go in with that kind of agenda. But yeah, that's my, like, that's my primary method, I guess. Does make sense, and I was wondering. You already mentioned it, probably, but still, like, does it extend the other way? Like, when you're traveling, say, strictly for leisure, does your does the academic in you, does the analyst in you, sort of step out when you're like strictly for leisure? I haven't been able to do that. Unfortunately, that's that is the problem, right? Like, I mean, don't uh, I don't know, don't turn your passion into a career, right? Like, it's <laughs> it's not. I really can't. I have. I don't. I can't remember the last time I was traveling. Like really uh, without thinking of doing stories or like finding some com something interesting and some kind of a pattern to it you know so that's really unfortunate I, I don't remember that feeling at all so <laughs> no uh, I mean 
uh yeah, yeah that's one thing i noticed like you travel a lot and then uh like whenever doing your bio for this uh for third mm-hmm. i noticed that you have asked for most of the places that uh, you have visited so i realized that yeah. yeah you do write about i mean yeah that that, that just makes sense um so back to rito rekha from open spaces mm-hmm. to confined spaces um so back travels uh which recall open spaces and mobility and freedom to some extent even if it's in the uh, sometime uh, like even if it's in the context of kashmir say, uh, for instance which is well not a site of freedom as we can as we all know so horus is basically uh, this sto- this particular article at least is a story about navigating a landscape shaped by repressive state apparatus uh but it's about moving around it's about navigating you know particular landscapes and finding stories there but your stories are all about you know uh, confined spaces yeah. so could you talk about like say the poetics of the prison in like as you know space is like my personal buzzword i work on it and yeah. things like that. So obviously this question will be about carceral space and the poetics of space in prison of confined spaces can you say yeah. something about that? i am going to say an anecdote because i don't think like i can speak about carceral carceral spaces but i don't think people actually want to hear about the analytics of it i'm just going to say an anecdote and you can judge whether it's interesting or not basically when um, i was reading this thing uh, an article about um, i think rimpel mehta's article she uh, went to different prisons all across west bengal and she was conducting her field work and i was reading about those because i also intend to do the same but i have no idea how i'm going to do it but i intend to do the same so she was speaking about how uh, the different spaces in which you conduct the interviews that drastically changes what you are going to hear from the prisoners for example when you first enter the prison so first of all you are made to sit in the um the introductory area i don't uh, the office basically you are supposed to sit in the office for like two or three days and then they don't let you enter at all uh, until you get the permission and everything so anyway once you enter they make you sit in the, uh, they made her sit in this little school room it's called a school room no classes take place or anything like that it's this damp little room which is completely closed off and four officers were standing around her when she was conducting her interviews and she got absolutely nothing so that was the first interview she got absolutely nothing the second day the officers were not present there was just one uh, person present she again got absolutely nothing so this went on because uh, she was i think she spent one or two months uh, completely swamped by this fact how am i going to get any information out of them because they thought this was like an a secret investigation the prisoners thought they were being called up to this particular room because they wanted uh, the police wanted some specific information out of them and this was a weird interrogation technique so ultimately how she uh, uh, finally got her interviews done was when this school room had to close down because of some particular reason i don't remember i think the school the teacher who was supposed to teach there retired or something like that the school room closed down and she was meant to sit under a mango tree and she thought this is even worse like this was inside uh, this was in the center of a courtyard and she thought this was even worse because this was the middle of the summer it was may and it was extremely hot who would want to come under this mango tree in the middle of the afternoon and talk to her obviously nobody would come, turn up but they did that was the surprise the prisoners loved coming uh, to talk to her under the mango tree because this was not an official space the officers did not want to the warders did not want to stand around because it was so hot for that exact reason so she was all along uh, alone with these uh, prisoners who right you know uh, you know sat around her and spoke about whatever they wanted and the most interesting thing is that uh, the mango tree offered another incentive because this was uh, in the middle of summer and uh, obviously the inmates waited for the mangoes to fall so whoever was talking to this uh, whoever was talking to rimpel mehta at that point of time they waited uh, for the mango to fall particularly during the time of the interview so they tried to prolong the time of the interview the prisoners tried to prolong the tra- time of the interview so she got this really interesting interviews under the mango tree just because they wanted the mangoes it was as simple as that and it was this one element of um, you know uh, it it's not something that is fixed the rest of the prison life it's all fixed for you the time and everything when something is going to happen but this was something unpredictable this was an unpredictable uh, surprise so all of the prisoners really enjoyed the interviews as well as her so this is this i thought was very interesting because wherever you conduct these interviews that drastically changes whatever 
uh, information that you're going to get about those interviews. I don't know if that answers your question, but I found that uh, tidbit very interesting. Oh, obviously, I mean, it's it's very relevant, right? The way space impacts our, um, our actions in a way. I, I have read in some sort of, you know, theory that space uh, shapes action, whereas action space, action shapes space, and it's a circular process, like the both go on to shape each other. Yeah. Uh, which brings me to basically my last question, which is for both of you. Um, we are basically living uh, living through a pandemic. We are witnessing history as we speak. We are uh, we are all confined, maybe definitely not at the level of either say Kashmir or prisons or anything that comparison in, in itself is obscene, but we are still like, we are facing restrictions, like a lot of them and something that is probably going to change that has changed our lives and this, these changes seem to be permanent. So I'm going to ask you both for your own research and field work and both for the subjects of your research and field work. How do you think the, the pandemic has impacted their lives and those spaces and, you know, and obviously your engagement with those people and those subjects and those spaces. So uh, Mehek, would you like to go first? Oh, yeah, sure. Um, of course, like, you know, uh, COVID has impacted everyone around the world. And I mean, in that respect, I think like Kashmir itself has also, you know, I mean, the common, um, let's say common um, problems that everyone's facing around the world, like in terms of disruption to healthcare or tourism or uh, the economy itself and, um, you know, other essential services as well as like the education sector. Of course, there's been an impact, but... Um, in Kashmir, like, you know, because of the context uh, of the conflict itself and some of the developments before the year, um, the COVID uh, struck us, like, you know, uh, in 2019, um, Article 370 was uh, remote, uh, abrogated um, by India and that kind of essentially um, uh, took away the autonomy of the region and it had a lot of impact uh, in terms of uh, political uh, administration and, you know, uh, of course, there were also a lot of curfews regarding that. And since then, it has been, um, you know, it's been kind of a prolonged lockdown. And things, of course, are opening up now. It's That's not besides the point. But uh, in terms of impact, I would say, like, in your, um, you know, it's it's very interesting to see what's happening right now. Because, um, you know, like, like I just mentioned, I mean, economy has been impacted everywhere here. It's worse because of the context. But... Um, here it seems to be that uh, this season, at least, you know, this spring summer season, um, when while uh, cases are going up all across uh, India and uh, even in Kashmir, there has been a spike in uh, COVID cases. But, you know, there's this kind of, um, you know, uh, very uh, like differential treatment in terms of uh, what COVID restrictions mean um, because tourism has really opened up and uh, you know, tourism to the, for the tourism sector itself, uh, things have really opened up and it's kind of looking up. And one could argue that okay, it has it has kind of brought in an economic, you know, uh, boost. Uh, however, um, cases are going up and like restrictions are going into different uh, kinds of spaces, like education spaces. Uh, recently, I think schools were uh, shut down again, and um, there's, there are talks of curfews being introduced, uh, but like, you know, um, even as of today, there's still a lot of confusion regarding political administration and things are still being reshuffled in terms of, um, you know, since uh, uh, 370 was removed. So um, COVID itself has kind of um, added to a lot of uh, existing issues and uh, especially in terms of, you know, just plainly administra uh, administrative problems as well. It still exists and... Um, I mean, political repression is uh, increasing uh, in the name of COVID around the world. So I think that also kind of uh, is something which, in the, um, in the if we start, if we try to study in the case of Kashmir, obviously applies. So um, yeah, I I don't know what's the way forward though, because um, like I mentioned, I mean cases are increasing, and uh, because of the kind of um, the kind of priorities uh, the government seems to have. Um, it doesn't seem like it's going away anytime soon and like we are kind of facing a so-called second wave. I don't know what happens after and one can only hope um, that this, at least this wave passes and uh, yeah. 
basically i want to speak about how the uh, you know indian government has handled the prison situation during covid and it has been terrible as usual i mean that's not unexpected particularly um basically all throughout the world uh, lots of prisoners have been released uh, of the ones who have been arrested under non serious offenses because of the decongestion of cells etc etc india has never dealt with uh, disease in prisons well for example prisons have always been the breeding ground for tuberculosis etc for example um, there's this thing that i think joy mitra says it i don't exactly remember who says it that uh, if you have tb you will be kept with everybody else but if you are in some way doing a hun- hunger strike you will be isolated so it's you know they are more concerned with isolating you because of your offenses than isolating you because of your disease, whatever i'm not saying they must isolate people with diseases but whatever they are supposed to be treated they don't care about you know treating prisoners anyway so covid has been no different for example i think the indian government has used this excuse to further limit um, outside uh, communication for example uh, these recently there was this news about uh, lawyers and uh, you know the lawyer access and family visits being prohibited during covid and that makes absolutely no sense because uh, the warders and everyone else if you really think about it i mean if you, if we are speaking about outside contact the warders and the other officers they are coming in and out of the jails right so it wouldn't make a difference if the families came to visit or if the lawyers came to visit and moreover this makes even less sense because uh, if you know about how these visits happen is it's through a lot of layers of nets i mean there's a huge physical distancing which happens anyway it's not like people sit across chairs and talk to each other anyway but then the first thing that the indian government decided to do decided to do is to stop this so which was very obvious what they were going for and the other things that that really struck me is that uh, first of all prisons are very understaffed in in general and also in terms of medical staff it's terrible for example i'm going to speak about two figures in jharkhand there is one doctor for 1375 prisoners and the second worst is west bengal of course there's one doctor for 923 prisoners so that's a good chart to talk uh, and <laughs> nearly talk and anyway this is uh, this is the problem with this entire system it's terribly understaffed it was worse before uh, it was already bad before it's getting worse and the other thing is that this hyper isolation the whatever this indian uh, whatever the indian government is going for it's not even being done correctly for example the supreme court had asked the high courts to appoint this committees called the hpcs the high powered committees what they were supposed to do is take care of the decongestion uh, so uh, with the people who were supposed to get bail you know uh, let them go out of the jail etc etc these sorts of things what happened is that this didn't work out because uh, the trial courts wanted the prosecutors to turn up for these uh, proceedings to happen and the prosecutor prosecutors didn't want to turn up because why go to the court during covid they had no reason to release themselves and so these releases which were supposed to happen eventually did not happen because of very practical factors so just the intention of the government now if we read about the reports the supreme court has ordered uh, these many prisoners are supposed to be released uh, out of jail but nothing nothing of that sort actually happened because the practical processes did not take place because people did not want to turn up to court people did not want to go to work as is obvious so ultimately the point is that uh, whatever was intended europe actually did i think uh, very well in releasing their prisoners i think 14 to 16% of the prisoners were released in an orderly manner russia <laughs> did not release any of its prisoners and i am that's very in character i think of russia so and then uh, india also wanted to do it but did it terribly as is also very in character for india so that's the condition okay uh, so this is where i suppose we are uh, supposed to end our conversation so thank you very much ritorekha and mehak it was lovely uh, talking to you about these issues and you have both said some really uh, really insightful things about prisons and kashmir and uh, your own research and everything so thank you very much thank and thank you to all our listeners for uh, your attention and for your time and that would be all um good night